um, volunteer recruitment, fundraising, community outreach, that's what they're doing. Um, and all those things create sustainability. So you're, you're developing the program, you're writing a program manual, you're getting funding for that program, and you're getting volunteers or whatever else needs to sustain that program even after the VISTA is gone. And most VISTA projects are three-year projects, um, each VISTA serving in a one-year term. Um, and so the idea behind, and we're behind the scenes in capacity building. So an example of that would be if I'm developing a program that provides transportation for the economically disadvantaged to services, appointments, things like that, I can write a grant to get the van, I can vol get volunteer recruitment for people to drive the van, but I will not be driving the van myself. That would be considered direct service, and um, that's kind of, there's different uh, areas of AmeriCorps that deal with direct service. Um, a little bit more about in Fairbanks specifically, the Fairbanks North Star Borough umbrella for uh, VISTA deals with alleviating poverty and economic development. That's one of our key things um, because it's stationed out of the economic development office in the, in the mayor's office of the borough. So we look at jobs training programs, um, we look at alleviating poverty kind of in hand with economic development. Um, and our VISTAs are nonprofit organizations all around Fairbanks. Um, for a little more information, uh, if you think that if you work for a nonprofit and you think you've got a VISTA project or a program that you think might be a good fit for a VISTA, um, you email uh, VISTA leader at fnsb.us and I'll get the email and we'll kind of start the conversation and go from there. But a little bit more about our VISTAs and our projects that we're going to hear from tonight. In Fairbanks, there are 10 VISTA projects, they're all listed um, here. We only have seven uh, VISTAs. There's only uh, seven that actually have a VISTA at the project, so we're currently recruiting um, for a couple of them. One would be Access Alaska, um, Calypso Farm, and Turning Light Farms, um, which are a couple of job training programs and uh, Calypso is a rural outreach um, for food security. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to get right into, you're going to hear from our first VISTA. Uh, her name's Sarah Smith. She's with Fairbanks Youth Advocates. And a little quick, uh, she's uh, our newest VISTA. And I just want to let you all know that she came from Florida uh, in November during that November cold spell. So she got out of plane at 80 degrees and got off the plane, what was it, minus 36 when we picked her up. So the fact that she didn't turn around and leave was just uh, amazing to me. I'll let me tell you a little bit about Fairbanks Youth Advocates. Um, my name is Sarah Smith, as he said, and I am the VISTA at Fairbanks Youth Advocates. Um, what Fairbanks Youth Advocates is trying to do is to open an emergency shelter for runaway and homeless youth here in Fairbanks. And one of the first things that I hear when I tell people what I do and why I do it is that they're confused because a lot of people don't realize that Fairbanks has a runaway and homeless youth population. And they do. And it's fairly significant. Um, every year there are between four and 600 runaway or homeless teens here in Fairbanks. And um, uh, while each team might have a uh, hundred, a thousand individual unique reasons why that team might run away, um, they usually have a lot in common, and they usually fall within one of three categories. And the first are the teens that run away because of conflict. They're fighting with their families all the time about their clothes and their lifestyle choices and their friends, and so they run away because they think that on the street they will find independence and they'll escape that conflict. And then we have the second group of teens that don't run away, but they're kicked out. And they're usually kicked out for that same conflict. Their parents can't handle the fight anymore, the rebellion, their lifestyle choices, or sexual orientation. And so the teens are left to fend for themselves. And of course, we have the third group of teens who leave homes that are chaotic, or dysfunctional, or dangerous. And so they might be being abused or neglected, or their families, um, uh, their parents have severe mental illness or drug and alcohol addiction. And so these teens leave home because they think that on the street they'll not only find independence, but safety and security. Um, and unfortunately, on all accounts, these teens are wrong. Life on the street is extremely dangerous, not only because Fairbanks has such incredibly variable temperatures, as I've already experienced, um, but uh, because they have incredible odds stacked against them. Um, 
Uh, they are much more likely to drop out of school, much more likely to get pregnant, abuse drugs and alcohol, suffer from mental illness, um, become cyclically uh, or chronically homeless. Um, and so what Fairbanks Youth Advocates is wanting to do is to provide uh, emergency shelter for six to 12 um, uh, runaway and homeless teens. We are hoping to open this time next year, so I may or may not get to see our opening, which means that as a VISTA, what I get to do is um, do the program development, do the research, um, establish funding, educate, like I'm doing right now, about the issues of youth homelessness. And so I want to encourage everyone to check out our website. I left some brochures, but it's fairly simple. It's fairbanksyouthadvocates.org. And um, not only can you find out exactly what we're doing and what we're up to, but um, how you can help and more information about teen homelessness in general. Um, and so on that note, I want to introduce Heather Monroe, um, and she will tell you about SOAP. advocacy program and we're sponsored through Fairbanks Counseling Adoption. Right. SOAP has been around since 2006. We started with just going into the libraries around town and uh, providing food bags and bus tokens and things like that. We moved into our new building in January of 2009. We're a drop-in center and we're located at 537, 537th Avenue which is right behind Wells Fargo Bank. And we're open Monday through Friday 2 to 6. However, someone is always there from 9 to 6. So if we have a youth that knocks on the door, gives us a call, and needs some, something immediately, then we'll provide it. We are a United Way member agency, and we reach out to 10 to 21 year olds who are homeless, at risk of being homeless, transitioning out of foster care, or just running away from home. Um, our goals are, are pretty simple we're, we're there to protect the youth. Um, and we work through many agencies around the town. Fairbanks Youth Advocates and the Rescue Mission and the Women's Center to, to make sure that these kids don't live without basic basic um, items and adequate shelter, food. Um, like I said, we're, we're a drop-in center, so we provide free bus tokens, survival supplies, uh, toiletry items, shampoo, toothbrushes, toothpaste. Um, we have a clothing closet with shoes and socks and anything that they might need. Uh, we do help the kids through, uh, we have two youth advocates on staff, and in addition to our program coordinator, Ashley Hughes, and they're there to help the kids or the clients um, navigate their age justice, business, and social services. Now, FCA does provide professional counseling services should any of the youth wish to take advantage of that. The drop-in center does have a computer lab, so we will help them with resumes, finding jobs, finding housing, things like that. Um, every third Tuesday of the month, we have an independent skills living class. And we also have creative activities. So there's someone usually always playing a game of chess. There's someone always drawing. Um, we do have a Wii, which was a gift uh, last year, so that has been a big hit. Um, and clients don't need to sign up. They can be referred by OCS, other resource agencies around town, and they can just stop in. Um, if you want to learn more, we have, I brought some brochures in the back. You can uh, call us directly or do a search on any of the social media websites listed, just FCA. So. And next up, we have Luke from UAF. organization. 
However, it's been a real joy for me uh, serving at UAF so far in the last six months, um, especially because although UAF does have tremendous capacity, they have uh, the, the capacity sometimes so dispersed throughout the university that my uh, service is usually to consolidate that and try and build some outreach programs for the community. So, and has in the Office of Admissions. So a lot of what my work is, is <laughs> is serving in the K-12 schools in Scotland. Um, the first program that I developed uh, early in October of this year was a pen prop program, which has so far paired 50 fourth graders in rural Alaska and Washington State with their very own UAF pen pal. I'm actually sending out a big bunch of letters tomorrow morning uh, from UAF students, and I can tell you that the uh, benefits are definitely not one side of the program. Um, while fourth graders benefit tremendously from having a mentor and someone who can tell them a little bit about college, uh, the, uh, the college students love it as well. And any outreach programs that originate from students have really been proven, proven to increase retention for students at the university. The second project I've been working on is a tutoring class, which I developed the curriculum for and am now teaching this spring, at, uh, mostly honor students in the university. The honor students are serving in K-12, or rather, 7 through 12 schools here in Fairbanks. They'll be tutoring uh, in any subject from 7th grade social studies to 12th grade uh, pre-calculus. So they're a really amazing bunch of people. I'm really privileged to work with them. And they, to get all together, will serve over 200 hours this year in the community. So we're hoping to grow that program in the years to come. Uh, the third project, and the, the really the more long-term project that I may not see come to fruition in my one Vista year, is promoting and spreading um, the word about service learning at the University of Alaska. Service learning is really similar to what um, I'm doing in the tutor training course. It's really providing an opportunity for college students to experience service, but through an academic lens. So students can go out and serve their community in a way that, um, that fits them, but they also get to reflect on that through, uh, through group reflections um, and scholarly reading. A lot of Vistas, if you're looking for Vistas all over the country, a lot of them you will find actually on college campuses doing this very same work. They're building partnerships with organizations like Campus Compact and the Center for Student Opportunity. who are really trying to pair college students with uh, the community in ways that will be meaningful. And my final project has been really build, uh, building some smaller service projects, uh, day-long projects. Uh, recently we just had Martin Luther King Day on uh, January 16th, and I had the great privilege to uh, serve alongside all of the VISTAs here. Uh, we organized a financial aid literacy day, uh, spreading the word at four local Fairbanks and North Pole businesses. Um, there's a great need in Fairbanks to, for more knowledge about scholarships and financial aid, both federal, state, local, um, tribal, uh, in every way. And so I really, uh, I really hope that we made a difference on that day, talking to um, over 200 uh, community members about financial aid and ways that they could pay for college. And yes, so I have a couple of pictures. These are some of the fourth graders that are pen, pen pals to UAF students. These are in Spanaway, Washington. Um, and over here is from our financial aid literacy day. Uh, we have a VISTA and then also two volunteers from UAF, and we also had several community volunteers. So a big thank you to all of them, and thank you to you all. And I get to introduce Megan Shear, who is the VISTA for Love in the Name of Christ. Thank you, Libby. Um, my name is Megan, and I am a VISTA at Love in the Name of Christ. It's located over on... Oh, I guess I should have the computer off the screen. There you go. Point of epic computer. And then just keep going through it. Yeah. And while we're going through this, I'm going to tell you all about Love, Inc. 
Um, the Love Inc. is not um, an agency in itself as much as it is actually a, a, it's a network of churches and agencies in Fairbanks that um, meet the needs of people who, you know, if they just need basic things or if they need a ride. 25 years ago, they started Love Inc. with um, a clearinghouse. People will call into the clearinghouse daily to, um, People will call in the clearinghouse daily just asking for, you know, basic needs. They'll call for food boxes. They might need help with rent. Um, what Loving does is they will find a church or an agency locally that can help them with that. Um, sometimes they can find the help. Sometimes they can't. Over the years, we have, they've really seen a need, though, that's started to grow, and it's that chronic dependency where people will call for the same things daily and, um, or, you know, or more often. So what they decided to do was establish a relational ministry program. And um, what that would do was actually pair human relationships with people as a resource. That would be the main resource. So through education and mentoring, we could help people become more um, sustainable. And um, actually in Austin tonight was our first DISA for Love Inc. And he actually developed two curriculums that we have now. Um, we have an image class, which is it's, uh, inspiring and, motiv and motivating adults to generate a scene. And um, what that class does is it actually helps people to address those issues that get them into those financial situations where they're just, you know, they experience that chronic dependency. And um, once, they, once they've gotten through the image class, it is an incentive-based class. They can go to classes and earn vouchers that they can spend on um, various things. Um, what they'll do is move into the QLO program, which is the Quality Life Education and Mentoring. And that begins with a money management course. And that actually, it starts with just basic budgeting as well as um, you know, how to keep your checkbook and insurance. And um, we also pair them with a mentor that walks with them for a year while they're in this program to help them be, you know, be a little more aware of just daily things. And um, again, it is incentive-based. They can, each time they meet with a the mentor, they can earn a voucher as well. And we have established a couple different ministries that um, they can use these these vouchers for. We have, since I've been there, we've established an oil change and um, car assessment ministry. We have a volunteer from uh, First Presbyterian that does that. We also have a small household goods closet, as well as a uh, bedding uh, materials closet. And uh, we have a lady in North Pole that does haircuts. So, um, one of the other things that we're doing to, for this project, and it, I'm sorry, it has launched. It did launch on January 15th at First United Methodist. So we have a couple volunteers that will be um, teaching that every Sunday at 2 o'clock. And if you'd like more information, we have to bring some, uh, a couple brochures over there. We have an, an event coming up on February 3rd for the Relational Ministry Program. It's our first annual Pastor Chili Cook-Off and Silent Auction. Um, one of the things that we do is this is, is um, we want to do things that are self-sustainable. So we want this to be an annual event. So it's the one thing, the one way we can bring all of our 50 churches together for something fun that they don't really get to, you know, they don't really have a, any event that brings them all together. And this will be a really nice chance to do that. Um, and it's going to be at Monroe Catholic High School and um, from 6.30 to 8.30. And um, five dollars for adults, three for children, and three for or, uh, three for three and under. And if you have any questions, you can just contact me right there. Right. Oh, and now I'm going to introduce Rima. <laughs> she is our Vista over at Joel's place. And just yeah, you want to press that button. <laughs> <laughs> advice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, well, hello. My name is Raymond Demosky, and I'm the America Vista and Safe Place Coordinator for Joel's Place. And um, since Joel's Place opened around 12 years ago, um, I've actually been working there and volunteering there. And so I'm actually one of the only long-term Alaskans <laughs> that is a Vista. So it's kind of nice to know the area and know all the agencies that I, I put together. And um, so I did come back about a year ago, or a little over a year ago, um, from Seattle. And um, I've been working for uh, building the Safe Place program. So some of you may be asking, what is Safe Place? 
and it is a new program in Fairbanks. Um, we provide immediate access to help and supportive resources um, for all young people in immediate crisis. So really what that means is that we're collecting community partnerships and um, readily having resources to youth that are in need, um, mainly focusing on runaway and homeless youth. Um, Safe Place is actually a national program that uh, also um, gives education um, and to thousands of young people on the dangers of running away and youth homelessness. And um, in Fairbanks, our safe place, we've created a bunch of locations where homeless or one-way youth can come and we'll be able to give them help. Um, our actually community partners are going to be Presbyterian Hospitality House, Crisis, um, Caroline Crisis Intervention, Joel's Place, Access Alaska, FCA So. Boys and Girls Club, Low Putt, Leaf and Bean Internet Cafe, the Mac Transit Bus System, uh, and Fairbanks Native Association. And then the sites that we're working on right now are going to be the public libraries, both in Fairbanks and in North Bolt, uh, Walmart, and the Fairbanks Youth Advocates, The Door, which Sarah works at, and um, is set to be open early next year. Um, we also have a, a partnership with Go North Taxi and Moose Cab, where they uh, actually pick up six youth per month for us and bring them either to a shelter or to a resource agency. And our 24-hour safe place hotline is run by Caroline Crisis Intervention. They are available 24-7 to take calls from youth that need help in the area. And um, the emergency shelter that we use right now is the Presbyterian Hospitality House, which you guys probably know them as PHH. And uh, what they are are a series of group homes that um, they actually have allotted uh, two emergency beds for us. But usually during the holidays, our school breaks, we, they have um, no capacity for our youth. And so we have been keeping Joel's Place open 24-7 during school breaks. And we also have extra contingency plans with host homes um, in the event that PHH is ever over capacity. And so um, a lot of the uh, agreements that we make with um, other agencies is to actually ask for people to sign up to do, um, to be an emergency or have an emergency bed for us. And of course we value all of our community partnerships and are excited at the prospect of gaining new ones. And on that, I will be passing it over to Sharon. Hi, my name is Sean O'Shea and I am the VISTA serving as the program director for Fairbanks First a bi-local program for the Fairbanks North Star Borough under the Fairbanks Economic Development Corporation. Uh, and what Fairbanks First does is it advocates that people spend 10% of whatever they spent outside the borough last year inside the borough this year. So that is, if you spent $100 online last year on books, let's say, you're an avid reader, we would like you to spend $10 of that $100 in Fairbanks. And in order to achieve that, the program has three aspects to it. The first of which is public outreach and advertising. And these are some of the events that we've taken place uh, in or have created over the past year since I've been here in April. Um, one of particular note is a commercial that we filmed with TV TV uh, that was aired, uh, I just stopped airing a few months back. But it was, uh, the gist of the commercial was someone making a decision to buy something online or purchase it in Fairbanks Buying it online, all you get is the object once it comes in the mail. Buying in Fairbanks, you have the multiplier effect where that money spent affects a lot of people. People are able to go out to dinner, have cars, families, very nice things. Uh, there's also a radio campaign uh, under the same uh, basic premise. Uh, and then two other things that were Fairbanks first originals. One was the Think Local Tailgate Party, which was held outside the Gold Panthers game this past summer. Uh, it was to get people interested in attending local sport, 
we had uh, local food there available as well. And the other one was the party local shopping bus, which just happened this past December 3rd. And that was a way for people to ride a party bus where they were given complimentary beer, wine, and snacks. And then driven around to local stores and they get some of their holiday shopping done locally <laughs> instead of going online. Uh, that was a particularly fun event. <laughs> and if anybody is interested, it'll be going on next year as well. Tickets aren't on sale yet. <laughs> uh, and some of the other things that we participated in, we were at the downtown market in the Panama Valley Farmers Market this past summer, as well as the Midnight Sun Festival, the Salter Fair, and we were at the uh, Gold Panners Parade in the market they had after. Uh, the next aspect is memberships. We are, uh, we do have a membership base. We have both individual and business memberships. Um, the two, one that combines the two is uh, individuals and businesses both get Fairbanks First t-shirts and membership cards. Uh, the t-shirts were very fashionable on the runway in Paris this past season. <laughs> so if you're interested, I would get on it now because it's going pretty fast. <laughs> Uh, members, you, the membership card gets you discounts at participating businesses uh, who are also uh, members. Uh, the businesses get an added bonus of having window decals, they get stickers, uh, they are able to host networking <coughs> events and also offer uh, the, these discounts through the membership card. Uh, and they're also able to use our name and logo in any kind of advertising or marketing materials we have. And the third and final one is advocacy and education. Uh, we recently, on December 1st, had the first in a series that we're calling the Think Local Lecture Series, uh, which is meant to be a community outreach and education component to the program. Uh, the first one, which isn't uh, listed here, was entitled Business in Fairbanks Competing Globally from the Interior, which was meant to give businesses uh, certain, uh, not requirements, but recommendations for how to compete uh, now that e-commerce has been widely accepted and that there is global competition now in interior Alaska for uh, consumers to uh, The next one, which is coming up in April, will be why, why local programs exist, uh, which is obviously a, uh, an important topic for us since we are a bi local program. Uh, it's hopefully set a groundwork, kind of an academic groundwork for why bi local programs exist, what the efficacy of them is in communities, and how you can leverage that to have greater memberships and greater involvement by both businesses and consumers. The next one, we also have a Think Local Pledge, which is a pledge for businesses and organizations and institutions in the borough to uh, essentially promise that they'll uh, augment their procurement process to make sure that local companies are both invited to into bid and are given, uh, are given, are weighted heavier than outside companies. And that is uh, it for me. I'd like to reintroduce now Colin, who pulls double duty in our uh, circle. I don't know how many of you recycle out there, but I'm going to tell you you probably should. And um, it's really great. And not only that, with our recycling center at the Fairbanks Rescue Mission, you're helping somebody give them a hand up to um, get some employment and get a job. Um, on September 5th, 2009, we established the Fairbanks Rescue Mission Recycling Center, which was a community recycling program. Um, and we use it as a vehicle for jobs training. We're uh, giving people job skills through a recycling center and through, um, by taking cardboard paper, we just expanded the plastics ones and two, which is PEET and HDPE plastic. The, more about what we take is on the back there. It kind of labels out um, how to sort it and uh, get into us. Um, so I'm going to talk a little more about job training at the Recycling Center. We call it our Green Collar Jobs Program and you'll start off in the program you'll come in thinking you know everything and you'll start as a receiving and collections assistant and that's when you learn what we take for recyclables, how to sort it, and a really large component of that is uh, customer service because there um, are guys or gals on the floor that are helping customers and people um, unload their recyclables and giving them kind of direction on how to better sort. Um, next you can see here is a picture of a baler operator. They're going to learn a lot of safety features of the balers and um, most cardboard bales are between 800 and 1,000 pounds so that's a lot of pressure um, crushing down on compactors. 
Um, and what everybody wants to become like right away from day one is a mature handler because that's when you get to drive the forklift. Um, but you have to go through our certified forklift training program. Um, so where they take their operator's uh, test plus the driving test. Um, and the next stage to that is a uh, material handler two. And that's where we give them one of our 53 foot uh, vans donated from either Linden or Horizon um, or tow, tow trailers. And they have to load 48 bales on that. And it's, uh, it's a lot trickier than you think because you flip them up sideways and it can be a mess. And if you're like me, you'll break one and then everybody gets mad at you because you've got to haul it off by hand. Um, and currently, we've had 10,000 hours of uh, jumps training back there from just program participants. Um, this is a picture I just want to let you know. Um, this is our Saturday general public collection. Um, what's really nice is when it's 30 below, uh, you can stay in your car and where you're going to unload it and sort it for you. Um, so that's the, that's the thing uh, if you come out between 11 and 5 on Saturdays. Um, and plus, it's kind of a little community connection where you can come and check out where we are. And, um, we can help you unload and uh, give you a little better insight on how to sort of recycle it. Um, currently today, it's been a fairly successful program. Um, we're at about 3.7 million pounds. As you can see, uh, primarily it's mixed paper, and mixed paper, kind of self-explanatory, it can be any paper product, so that's why it's uh, failed a little bit more. Um, but cardboard's over a million pounds, which is really good. Uh, we get a lot of newspaper. We have a partnership with the news miner. Everything that's not sold, um, they give us about four to eight pallets a week of newspaper. And then we just started our plastic bottle recycling in April, so those numbers are really low, less than a percent each. And um, we take our aluminum to CNR pipe, and uh, that's the best monetary value one that there is. Um, we also have over 250 partnerships, uh, recycling partnerships. Most businesses come and drop up, but we do have a commercial pickup program that we recently started. Um, this is a picture of one of our largest partnerships. Um, it's with the Fairbanks Memorial Hospital. They have a 40-yard compactor, which delivers about 7,000 pounds of uh, cardboard on a, given, on a given day. They come about uh, once every 10 days. And then we have a lot of smaller partnerships. Here's a picture of some kids from uh, Fort Wainwright summer program. Um, that recycled uh, all their classroom stuff and they would come and drop it off and uh, we provide tours for them and give them kind of fun activities to do with recycling. And they really like coloring so that made it a little easier on me when I was uh, working with them. But uh, if you have any questions, um, I think we have some time for questions. I don't know. Yeah, we can. Um, on behalf of all of us, I want to thank you for coming. And um, since I forgot my sign sheet, I'm going to make one up if you want to kind of learn uh, each quarter what businesses are doing all throughout Alaska. Because um, there's two, there's a rural program and then another program in Anchorage uh, that are working to eliminate poverty. Um, so once again, thank you all for, for coming out and supporting us and seeing what we do in the community. Any questions, and if it's about a specific program, feel free to ask and we'll invite that person. Yeah, he is. You should all probably come back up because you can feel those Make a pyramid. <laughs> Are there any questions? Yes, Joe. So, so where are you all from and how did you end up in Ferris? Did you get to pick where you go or? Um, you, you do get to pick where you go. Uh, Basically, you go through the online portal, you create an application, um, you sit in your hometown, you feel like exploring Alaska, and so you look at Vista positions up here, and um, you interview with the site and the Vista leader, um, and then if they both like you and think you're a good fit, uh, you go through the process. Um, you end up flying to a pre-service orientation before getting here, and then you come up and you hit the ground running. Um, we all have individual stories from that. I, I, I don't know if we have time. Would you like to hear them all? Yeah. Oh, okay. Where are you all from? Okay, I'm from uh, Michigan. Washington, D.C. Serving. And I wonder, <clears throat> are those volunteers who are doing the mentoring?
mentoring and training and serving, and who trains those mentors, and what kind of programs do they have to? Um, is that we part? we would definitely um, primarily at Vista would be setting up that volunteer training, and they can also conduct it, but they're not going to do the actual mentoring themselves typically. But they would train. They would locate. They would and train. They would the do the volunteer recruitment and training definitely. Because if you're setting someone up in a year long mentorship with somebody to mm -hmm. teach them. Yeah, I mean, but but Vista projects are are um, they're each three years long. They're the three year projects, and even though um, we only serve a year term, the idea behind it is you want it to be able to continue without me there. Right. So it's kind of almost setting up that um, you'll write the program for it. a full time staff member might take that over, um, okay. but the full time staff member didn't have to write the program. That was the that's why the VISTA came in, to so, write that program. So for your green jobs, uh, it sounds like somebody's paying, are they getting a stipend, or is it a voucher system for having, for taking on this job, not the mentor, but the individual who's got the training, who's receiving the training? Uh, so um, if they're doing some dangerous work, are they getting workers' compensation covered? By yeah, there's all an insurance, an insurance covering with the Green Collar Jobs Program. and. What it is, though, is it's mission residents that are running it, and they do get a small stipend, but they're also receiving career counseling, three hot meals a day, free free saving, and they it's not like we're they work 40 hours a week um, mm -hmm. back there. It's kind of a mix between that and career counseling, getting them hooked into job services and different programs around the area. If. Uh you know somebody that needs help, is there any one place you can send them to uh, to find out which place he needs to go to? That's a really good question. Um, it, it's kind of one of those things, um, it, it depends on what kind of help, but we're almost, almost all of our organizations <coughs> that work together that deal with that, um, the population that usually needs help. And so it's almost like, um, for example, if we get youth at the rescue mission, um, we usually don't take anybody under 18. The very first thing is, is we're going to call SOAP, we're going to call Joel's place, we're going to make those connections to so so that they can get the proper help that that we don't necessarily provide for somebody that's younger. Um, but I don't know. Does anybody else have any insight on? That would be a great program. Um, Love the Ink is um, people do call the clearing house when they have you know they have a need for rent money or heating assistance is a big one that we get. Um, and we can't, you know, they can never guarantee that we can find the help because, again, we are an agency of agencies and churches. So what we do is um, we do network out and we mobilize the churches to, um, you know, to find volunteers and help for those that are in need. So, but Loving is also a very good one to call for, you know, if there is something in need. <coughs> Who's the safe places? That is Brayma. Right. So the safe places, there's a sign there that says this is a safe place, and so children age 12 and 15 will be able to go to Walmart and know they found a safe place and to, to be. Yeah. I mean, it's open 24 hours a day, so what does that mean? What it means is that we actually do school presentations throughout the year. We do different events, and we get the word out there that if they call a certain number, or if they go into the site, which is the safe place with the sign, they can actually go to an employee at the safe place and say, I need some help, and we will find them a place to stay or a place to come for resources. And so most of those places on your safe place list are 24 hours a day. Correct. So it is, and they can call Caroline, I mean, pretty much anyone can call Caroline 24-7. And there will be someone at Caroline that can give them counseling and help them wherever they need help with. So, so, how does uh, how many vistas are in Fairbanks? How many vistas are in Fairbanks? And can you do more than one year? And and how would an organization get a business? Three great questions. Uh, there are seven businesses in Fairbanks right now. Um, we're all right here. We have uh, a lot of uh, 12 positions um, currently. We'll, we'll 
have 11 filled, um, probably by, uh, I would say, June of this year. Um, you would go about getting a VISTA by contacting the VISTA leader at fnsb.us, um, which will be me for another four or five weeks, but beyond that, it, it'll, it'll be, we've got the new one coming in, so that'll be great. And then um, you are, you can do, you can, to, to be honest, you can do as many years of VISTA as you want, um, but the carrots to kind of stain, I guess you can call it a carrot, is um, we get an service award for each year of commitment, and um, for the first three years, that's a $5,500 education award. For the first two years? Yeah. For the first two years, that's a education award. But beyond that, it's just a, it's a much smaller um, monetary award. But you can do VISTA over and over again. You can be any age to do VISTA, which is a little different than some of the other AmeriCorps programs. I don't see any other questions. So um, check out some of the resources in the bag if you want to learn more about a lot of the programs uh, we talked about tonight. And once again, I really appreciate all of you coming out. And thanks for your support.